In a few of the previous videos, I've mentioned the electron transport chain without really talking too much about it. In this video, I want to introduce it a little bit. So the purpose of the electron transport chain really is to make lots of ATP, lots of energy. So the electron transport chain is actually, uh, basic, the reason it's a chain is it's, it's, a, it's a series of redox reactions ending with taking oxygen and actually turning it into water. So if we're taking oxygen to water, we're adding some hydrogens here, lowering the number of bonds to oxygen. We're actually reducing, right, this is a reducing reaction. Uh, we're reducing oxygen to water. Um, and because the series of redox reactions actually ends with oxygen being turned into to water, this is considered an aerobic process, right? Because oxygen is actually required in this chain of redox reactions. More specifically, this, the purpose of, of the electron transport chain is to reoxidize all the NADHs and FADHs that we've made up until this point, whether it was in glycolysis or the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex or the TCA cycle. Any NADHs and FADH2s that we made will be reoxidized back into the NAD pluses and FADs, respectively. Now, where is the electron transport chain? It's somewhere in the mitochondria, but specifically where in the mitochondria is it's along the inner membrane. Now, um, which I'll talk about in just a second when I get to this diagram. Um, the electron transport chain, like I mentioned, is a series of redox reactions ending with going from oxygen to water. Now, um, that, those, that series of redox reactions is coupled to the phosphorylation of ADP to yield ATP, right? So we, because we want to make ATP in the electron transport chain. So what we do that is a bunch of different redox reactions is, is coupled to the phosphorylation of ADP to ATP. Now, if you recall, ADP, phosphorylating ADP to, or to make energy, is that delta G going to be positive or negative? This is going to be a positive delta G because we're making the energy, right? So that's going to be, energy is going to be required. So if this process, if taking ADP and phosphorylating it to ATP is an endergonic process, and it's coupled to this series of redox reactions, we would expect this series of redox reactions to be what? We would expect this series of redox reactions to be exergonic, right? Because they need to be coupled to the pho this phosphorylation, right? So they need to be releasing energy that we can use to power the production of ATP. <laughs> Excuse me. So how exactly does that even happen? Well, the, the electron transport chain, basically what it's supposed to do, is supposed to build up an electrochemical gradient with a high pH, or excuse me, a high con, uh, H plus concentration, which is a low pH, a high H plus concentration and a low pH in the intermembrane space. And a low H plus concentration, which would be a high pH in the mitochondrial matrix. So now what are these things? That brings me to this diagram here. I'll talk about how this diagram and these words here deal with this idea of an electrochemical gradient. In case you already, don't already know the anatomy of a mitochondrion, which is an, an, an organelle the, known as the energy powerhouse of a cell, this thing labeled um, A here is the outer membrane of the mitochondria. Um, I'm just going to abbreviate mitochondrial as just mito. Now the mitochondrion, right, has two membranes. Okay, so it has this outer membrane here and this inner membrane here that's actually folded a bunch here. This is the inner mitochondrial membrane. And that is actually the membrane where we have, that's where the electron transport chain is, right? So we mentioned that uh, the electron transport chain exists along the inner membrane of the mitochondrion. So the electron transport chain, all of its little protein complex as well, which I'll talk about in the next video, um, they're going to be along this membrane here, this inner membrane. Now C and D are actually pointing to different uh, sort of spaces. So C is the space between the outer membrane and the inner membrane. So that is the intermembrane space.
So that intermembrane space is the space between two membranes. If you think about what international flight is, international flight is flight between countries, right? So this space is between the two membranes. And D, of course, is the mitochondrial matrix, which is just the space that is bound by the inner membrane, which is where, of course, the, the TCA cycle occurs and the pyruvate dehydrogenase uh, step occurs. Um, now, I mentioned this idea of building an electrochemical gradient with a high H plus concentration in the intermembrane space and a low H plus concentration in the mitochondrial matrix. So what this electron transport chain is basically going to do is this, there's going to be a bunch of redox reactions, and through these redox reactions that are being extragonic, that um, that energy that that energy released is going to be used to build up H plus a uh, high H plus concentration out here in this intermembrane space, whereas we're going to have a very low concentration of H pluses inside the matrix. So we're going to have a bunch of H pluses out here in the intermembrane space. And uh, we're going to build up an electrochemical gradient, a chemical gradient, because we're going to have a lot of a lot more of something um, on one side of a membrane than the other, and um, because we have a lot of a, a lot of these protons on one side of the membrane, but it's also an electrical gradient, a voltage gradient, because with these these H pluses, they're charged, right? These this this plus is a positive charge, so we're going to have a positive charge on the uh, in the intermembrane space and a and a, and a relatively negative charge in um, in the mitochondrial matrix as far as voltage, the, the, the electrical potential difference. So uh, I'll talk more about that in, in later videos. But what we needed to understand um, in about this about the electron transport chain is that because it's a series of redox reactions, we need to understand these uh, this idea of reduction potentials. And the reason why is because we want to know where the electrons are going because if there's a bunch of redox reactions that means there's loss of electrons, gain of electrons and we want to know where these electrons are going. Um, that's where reduction potentials come in. So reduction potentials essentially what they do is that if you know the reduction potentials value you basically know how good or bad an electron donor or acceptor something is. I forgot to put is here. <laughs> um, so if you have a low or very negative reduction potential, that means that that, that particular species what, that you're concerned with does not want to be reduced. Low reduction, it does not want to be reduced. So what is reduction? Reduction is the gain of electrons. So if something has a low reduction potential, it doesn't want to be reduced, it does not want to gain electrons. So Instead, what it would rather do is it would rather give electrons away, right? Which would be oxidized, right? It would want to be oxidized. So if it doesn't want to gain the electrons and it would much prefer to give them away, it would be considered a better donor. If something you know has a relatively low uh, reduction potential, it's going to be a better donor. Um, so whereas a, a high or very positive reduction potential indicates that that thing wants is wants to be reduced high reduction it wants to be reduced it does want to be reduced if it does want to be reduced it wants to gain electrons so it will accept electrons from something else now this would be a better acceptor well we know that the electron transport chain as we set up here we said that it's a series of redox reactions ending with oxygen being reduced to to water so if oxygen wants to be reduced, what would we expect its reduction potential to be like? Well, if it wants to be reduced, and it's actually the last thing in the chain that's reduced, it's going to be a very good acceptor, right? It's gaining those electrons. So oxygen is a very, very good example of something that would have a high reduction potential. It's actually its reduction potential is 0.8816 volts, um, which is would basically describes a spontaneous reaction that oxygen will definitely willingly accept electrons from something else that has a um, a lower reduction potential which is which is something I was trying to get out over here so if something does not want to gain electrons and would rather give them away it's going to be a donor well, what would we expect to be a good donor here scroll back up briefly so we said that we're oxidizing NADHs and FADH2s back to NAD plus and FAD. So those things are going to be oxidized 
if they're being oxidized, they're going to, they don't want to gain, they're not gaining electrons, they're losing them, right? So they're giving up their electrons, therefore they're better donors, and they would have low reduction potentials. So NADH actually is a, a good example of a good donor, and its uh, uh, reduction potential is negative 0.32 zero volts. Now to be specific, a reduction potential is based on this idea of um, something being reduced. So NAD, NAD plus would, would get reduced rather to NA, NADH. So that process has a negative um, uh, reduction potential and that basically means that it's non-spontaneous. So it would rather not gain electrons, instead it wants to give them up. So it is a better donor. Essentially what you do, what do you really need to know about all this nonsense here? is that when it comes to reduction potentials, low reduction potentials means it wants to give up its electrons, high reduction potentials means it wants to accept those electrons. So what, if you know that two different species have two different reduction potentials, you should know that the electrons will flow from the low reduction potential to the high reduction potential. So in this case, if we're going from we, the if NADH and O2 are, are near each other, then NADH is going to donate its electrons to O, which makes sense because NADH has the lower reduction potential and O2 has the higher one. So it's very, very important to keep this idea of reduction potentials in mind when thinking about the electron transport chain because there's a bunch of different things involved in the electron transport chain and they all have different reduction pot potentials. So if I presented to you the question, which of which of these different things has a higher or lower reduction potential? Well, knowing at what point it comes down in the chain, in the electron transport chain, you should be able to judge which should have the higher reduction potential, which should have the lower reduction potential. Uh, anyway, I'll get to, to more details about that in the next video. Thanks for watching.